Well, good morning and welcome to church. If you're in the foyer, please come on in. Why don't we stand as we get ready to praise and worship our almighty God. Amen. If you're online, please welcome. If you've got any prayer requests, put them in the comments and we'll pray for you this morning. Father God, we declare your name in this place, God. We proclaim that you are alive in this place, God, that you are here, Father God, and that your power is working and moving in our lives every day, Father God. We come into your throne room this morning to give you all the praise and all the glory and all our worship. Amen. 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 The presence of God this morning is just wonderful. You know, we're just so grateful that uh, our hearts are open to God. So I want to pray this morning that our hearts would be open to receive God's word, that we would grab something from it and put it into our life. Amen? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence of your spirit in here. We thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done. We open our hearts to learn about you, who you are, Jesus, and so that we can become more like you. We want to be not just a light, but a blazing light of your goodness to our community and our family and our friends, that they would see Jesus. I pray this in your mighty name. Amen. We are looking at the events of uh, Christ right up to the point of Easter. Last week, Pastor Randall spoke about Simon the Cyrene and what an incredible message that was. If you missed it, you need to listen to it. Incredibly powerful how Simon, God brought Simon into that situation, absolutely changed. Uh, So this morning, we're looking at those pivotal moments leading up to to this one in particular. So this is the scene to which Jesus speaks. So he's he's moving in front of Simon. He's carrying, uh, uh, he's just laid the cross, crossbar to Simon and Jesus is walking and Simon is behind him and the scene is this that we have people who are shouting bloody murder to Christ they're angry they're they're full of hatred and Christ is is walking and he's covered literally in blood when he was on the cross the, the scripture tells us he was almost unrecognizable like a man and as he's walking and people are shouting and taunts, and if you've ever been in a crowd where the, the crowd almost loses its mind and, and being reasonable, this is one of those moments and they're shouting and probably spitting and taunting and laughing at Christ as he walks to the place of the skull, Golgotha. And as he's walking and they're screaming, he comes upon another group and it's a group of women. And... Christ says something here that is actually, when we read it in Scripture, it's quite shocking. And you might even think that Jesus is dismissive of what is taking place. So as he's walking to Golgotha, and on one side of them, there is this screaming of people who want him dead. And the other side are women weeping. They're weeping, their hearts are torn. You know, if you've experienced the pain of losing someone and how that, it kind of like drills down to the very soul of you and you feel that loss deeply and the women are crying because they've lost their, their, their leader, their teacher, the one whom they love, the deliverer, their Messiah. And this is what Jesus says to them. Luke chapter 23 verse 28. Jesus turned to them as this is going on, weeping and shouting. And he said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. What a bizarre thing to say. Imagine that tension of men and women screaming for his death and others weeping for him. And you would think that when he sees the scene of these women weeping, that he would feel something. But he says that, daughters of Jerusalem, and that is actually a tender type of saying. It's a, it's a love saying of people that you're a daughter of Jerusalem. We respect you. We love you. And he says, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. And the women, you can imagine them sitting there and standing there and they're weeping and they're thinking, what does he mean? What? Weep for ourselves. Jesus, you're the one suffering at this moment. 
Jesus, you're the one who's in pain. Why would we weep for ourselves? And as that question was in their mind, and no doubt, no sooner had that question formed in their mind, Jesus gives them the answer. And he says this in verse 29. For the days are coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, and the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have never nursed. It's just like, what? For the days are coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless. And confronted with these words and their meaning, Jesus continued, and he says this, People will beg the mountains, fall on us and plead with the hills, bury us. And then he continues with this. For if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? And when Jesus spoke to them, don't weep, weep for yourselves. He wasn't being insensitive. For he'd come to do a great work, the work of the cross. He knew what would take place. And Jesus was speaking about what was to come. He's speaking the prophetic word. It is now AD 33 and some 35 years later, something would take place. Sorry, 33 years later. The Jews rebel against the Roman occupation in AD 66. They said, we've had enough of this. And they rebel against Rome. And Nero is the emperor. And he sends a contingent, his force, to get them under control. In two years, they put down the, re the revolution in the northern province. And in AD 68... Nero takes his life. And then the general Vespasian in AD 68 is now appointed as the emperor. I was talking to Ray and Sally on uh, Friday and we were talking about different things and it actually came up about Vespasian. Imagine that. Of all subjects, a Roman emperor, AD 68, Vespasian. And Ray said to me, I actually have a coin with the head of Vespasian on it. A coin that's over 2,000 years old. Imagine that. What are the chances of that? And you can see his, his head here and Ray will probably show you. Vespasian. So Vespasian who was leading this army against the Jews is called back to Rome to take over because Nero's lost his life. And so he appoints his son Titus to take over. Two years later in AD 70, something incredible takes place. Titus breaches the outer walls of the city of Jerusalem and he breaks through and it's actually Passover time. And they began to sack the city they start to destroy the city and then they move to the temple and they rob the temple and they burn the temple this is the thing that Jesus spoke about that there is a time that is coming and when that happened in AD 70 historically it is recorded that thousands of people were murdered thousands and that the survivors of that time were either sent to the mines in Egypt or they were sent to Rome as fodder for the games and entertainment. And Jesus says, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. And at the very end, he says this. He says, if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? And we look at that and we think, that's quite a bizarre saying. But it wasn't such a bizarre saying back then. Because what it meant was, when the trees are green and they're hard to burn, that's the innocent. What will they do to the wicked? 
And Jesus is speaking about what was going to take place. And he says there, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. There are pivotal moments in the life of Christ that we've covered over the last few weeks because it's so important to understand what Good Friday is about, what Resurrection Sunday is about. Jesus is betrayed, betrayed by Judas in the garden as he's praying. He's denied by Peter in the courtyard. He is in pain and he's carrying a cross and now he's met with crying and he says, do not weep for me, weep for yourselves for something terrible is about to happen. All these moments, folks, they point to Christ's compassion for people. Christ's compassion. You know, Mel Gibson did a movie and it was called The Passion of Christ. And you know, the word passion in the Latin is pati, which means to suffer. I think he should have called it the compassion of Christ. You see that because in that moment there is great compassion of Christ for a nation and a world where he moves through these different pivotal moments that reveal who he is. This is a moment of great compassion. In these most trying times, when he's going to the cross, friends, he does not need your tears. He thinks of your tears to come. He was thinking of those women. This is what's going to happen. Don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. And he's warning them. Here's the great thing. Jesus knows what's going to happen in our lives. He doesn't need our tears. He cries for us. He weeps for us. He knows there will be challenges. And he cares for you more than himself. You think he does not care. He does care. He's not concerned about himself and his suffering. He's, com he's, he's wanting you to understand how much he cares for you. You know that word compassion, the, loot, uh, sorry, the root word in Latin is pati, as I said, which means to suffer. But the prefix com means with, to suffer with. Compassion means that when Christ went and when he lived, he suffered with. It is a connection with another person. It goes beyond sympathy and empathy. You see, sympathy and empathy are both feelings. When we feel something, we're moved. But it doesn't have a component in it that is so powerful as the word compassion. You see, sympathy, sympathy is a feeling we get of pity and sorrow when we see something. You know, when we, we see something on television and we, we feel, gee, that's just so terrible. Empathy is where you understand the feeling because you've experienced it. But compassion moves to a different level. Compassion comes alive when there is action. And Christ has compassion. It is to be moved inwardly. It is to feel the suffering of another and then to act. Because compassion moves us to act. It's not like, oh, I, I understand how you feel. Oh, I feel sorry for you. It's the compassion of Christ when he went to the cross. He was to suffer with and for you. I read this quote by Frederick Buchner, and I thought it was the greatest quote I've heard about compassion. And he says this, compassion is sometimes the fatal capacity of feeling what it's like to live inside somebody else's skin. Imagine that. It is knowledge that can never really be any peace and joy for me until there is peace and joy finally for you. It's something that was, it, it almost embodies us 
and we feel it so much that we must move to do something with it. That's what Christ was like when he saw a wicked world that wanted to do their own thing and go their own way. But he saw them as bruised and broken, almost like a candle that is about to be snuffed out. He was moved and so he came. It's sometimes that fatal capacity for feeling what it's like to live inside the skin of someone else. That's incredibly powerful compassion. I just want us to reflect about the compassion in the life of Christ for a moment. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 and 36, it says this. Jesus traveled through all the towns and the villages of that area, teaching in the synagogue and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Can you imagine when he saw them that he felt that, that thing inside him that moved him to act? And here's why. Because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Have you ever seen a child lost in a shopping center? And you hear that cry, Mom, Dad. That's what they were like to Christ. They were lost. They were helpless. They didn't know what to do. And disease and sickness was there. In Matthew 14, verse 14, it says this. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat. And he had compassion on them. And healed their sick. Compassion on them. He moved with such power and action. In Mark chapter 1 verse 40 to 42. Listen to this. A man with leprosy. Came and knelt in front of Jesus. Begging to be healed. Have you ever begged for something folks? I mean really begged. Got on your knees and cried out. God touch me. Heal me. Make me whole. Beg so much that you can cry no more. Beg so much that the pain just becomes numb inside you. This leper came and begged Jesus. Because it was the last moment of his life. Because if he didn't get healing, he was going to die one of the most horrible deaths known to us. Begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. And this is Jesus moved with compassion. Jesus reached out and touched him. I'm willing, he said, be healed. And instantly, folks, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. The compassion that Christ felt for these people who were lost. They don't know how to live. They live a life of religion, restricting them to life. For the very reason he came to bring life and freedom. Think about that. And this religion that they had. And a religion that you can have that can shrink you down to nothing and hold you and bind you. Instead of laugh and enjoy and embrace and go through life with excitement. It's not void of challenges but a life inside us that energizes us to push forward. That's the life of Christ. People were healed. I don't think we really understand the devastating times they lived in. Suffering with leprosy and tuberculosis and typhoid and pneumonia. These were fatal diseases, friends. They knew they were going to die. But they, they just didn't know they were dying. They were then restricted from human contact. They could not be in contact with their family, their friends, their community. There was loneliness. What a desperate, sad life. And Christ comes and his compassion comes to the forefront. And he heals them and sets them free. What a Christ that we have as our saviour. How beautiful, how masterful he is. When he sees humanity broken. And if you are sitting there this morning and you feel broken inside, there is the compassion of Christ that waits for you to be embraced in your life. 
If you call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. But why do you hold back? What fear is in your heart? He's come nothing but to lay down his life for you because he loves you. Luke 7 verse 13. I cried when I, I saw this. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry. This is a scene of a woman, the widow of Nain. There's no record of her husband and now her son is dead. You see, your children were your hope for your future to live a reasonable life. They were the pension. They were the support. And now the son has gone too. Can you imagine the anguish on the face of this woman as she, she realizes her son is gone and her future is desperate and bleak? And Jesus raises him from the dead. Luke 15 verse 20. The lost son. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. This is a picture, folks, of what it's like in heaven when one of us returns to the Father. A lost son returns to the, to the Father and the scene is so joyful because the power of compassion has been activated by Christ. You know, sometimes we get scripture wrong. It says there's joy in heaven. There is actually joy in heaven. There is joy in the presence of angels when one returns and repents. Whose joy is it? It's not the joy of the angels. It's the joy of the Father because of the compassion of the Son who laid down his life. It's the joy of the Father. Can you imagine the joy of the Father in heaven? How it would be like fireworks going off and sounds of excitement because of the compassion of Christ. In these moments, Jesus sees and feels deeply for the people be, before him because he takes action when he sees the pain of others. This is why this portion of scripture is so important. Don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. You see, he was moving to the cross because he knew in that one final act of the cross would change everything in their life. And for us, dear friends, the challenge is that we would be moved with the compassion of Christ in the life we live now. We cannot go through life and ignore the needs of others and the pain of others. We must demonstrate compassion. We need to have and be moved with the compassion of Christ. We need to. Is it possible, dear friends, to have that compassion? To almost feel like you're in the skin of another person when their heart is broken? When their mind is shattered, is it possible? Yes, a hundred times. A hundred times. Then how does this take place? In the inner part of the being that experiences compassion. Can we define it as part of the heart or the spirit of a person? What is it that takes us when we, we're so moved that we can't just hold back, we must do something. Paul the Apostle gives us insight. And here's the scripture in Philippians chapter 1 verse 8. It said, God knows, and Paul's speaking, he says, God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ. 
He says, I long for you with the tender compassion of Christ. You see, that's why Paul says, to follow me is to follow Christ. It's no longer I that live it. It's Christ that's living in me. There's this compassion in me that I just can't help it when I see the brokenhearted, when I see the confused, when I see the sick, I move with such compassion. I must act. Paul had this compassion. It was not his compassion. It was Christ's compassion. Can I suggest that in order that we reach the depth of compassion, we must not harden our hearts. We have to keep our hearts tender. Look at that, the tender compassion of Christ. Paul speaks of the heart that's tender. It's soft. That is the only way true compassion of Christ can flow from us. Look what Paul says in Philippians 2 verse 1. He says this, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Is there any comfort? Any comfort from his love if we belong to Christ? Any fellowship together in the spirit? And then he says this, are your hearts tender and compassionate? Is your heart tender? Tender and compassionate. Why would he ask that question? Why do we need to ask ourselves that question? Because folks, from my experience, my heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's what Jeremiah said. Because our heart can change from this to this. From feeling something to feeling nothing. To having compassion to having nothing. Or sympathy and empathy and no compassion. In Mark chapter 3 verse 5. There's a story of a guy with a withered hand. And it's the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day. The holy day. The religious day. And Jesus asks the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the religious people of the day, is it good, is it right to do good on the Sabbath? And he looks at the man with a withered hand, however it was, is it good? And they don't answer him. And this is what Jesus says. He was angry with them because of the lack of their compassion. And then he says, stretch forth your hand. I'll show you what God is really like. Compassion. Is your heart tender? Is it soft? David cried, create in me a clean heart, O God. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Keep your hearts tender. Above all things, watch over your heart. For out of it comes the issues of life. Where is your heart, friend? Is it tender? Is it compassionate? Are you moved to do something? 1 John 3 verse 17 says this. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in needs, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? How can God's love be in that person when there is no compassion? Let me tell you this, compassion reveals the depths of God's love in a person's life. That's what it does. Compassion reveals the depths of God's love in our life. I know there is much, there is much need in this world. But you can show the love and the compassion of Christ where you are with what you have as the opportunity opens for you. I can't change the whole world, but I can change someone's world. Years ago, I, I read a story about a little boy who was walking along a beach and it was covered with thousands of starfish that had been washed up on the shore. 
And the little boy was picking up the starfish and throwing them back into the ocean in a desperate way. And a man, the cynical man walking by says, you'll never get them all. It, you'll never do it. Is it really that important? And the little boy picking up the starfish and says, it's important to this one. And he throws it in. Don't think about what you can't do. Think about what you can do. Where are you in your work? With your family, with your friends. When compassion is needed, do you act? Because Christ in that moment, there was great compassion. He did not weep for himself, but he wept for others. And he weeps for us to move with compassion. Bill Widener said this, do what you can where you are with what you have. Do what you can where you are with what you have. The challenge, dear friends, is to keep your heart tender. Because let me tell you, this world that we live in is nothing but a selfish, self-centered greedy world we live in and we must always check our heart in fact i think it would be great if we stood and checked our heart have a heart check up just check is it beating the way that christ would have it to beat not out of sympathy not out of empathy not just out of feelings but being moved with action. You see, Christ shows us how we are to be. And here is the thing. As soon as we begin to move in faith, guess what happened? This happens. He empowers us. But if we never move with compassion, he'll never empower us to meet that need. I know that maybe your hearts are stirred this morning. I don't know why this message is this way, but this is how I feel this morning. That we've got to keep our hearts soft and tender before the Lord to reach our community, to reach our friends. And instead of turning a blind eye, we turn an open heart. We sang this morning, oh my goodness, talk about a morning of heart response. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, that I might see you to see what you do so that I might do that for you. How amazing if God is calling us to this, to be people of compassion. Passion. 